Okay, so the poll that people are completing is how do you feel about ChatGPT? Um, so we have a lot of curious and many excited and many uncertain. I'm glad to see that we don't have too many angry, um, but I think a fair amount of anxiety um, can come with this as well, that being anxious about it or having a little bit of fear of how it's going to change what we've been doing um, is a natural reaction when we have a change like this in a technology um, that has so many different applications and potential uses and misuses within education. So again, I'm Ryan Watkins. I'm a professor of ed technology leadership and human technology collaboration at George Washington University. And with me um, today, I have Natalie Millman. You wanna say hello, Natalie? Sure, hi, I'm Natalie Millman. I am professor of education technology in our master's of and, and graduate certificate program in educational technology leadership and also a faculty member in the human technology collaboration PhD program and department chair of our department of educational leadership. And Mike, our third presenter today. Thanks, Ryan. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here this late afternoon and evening. I'm Mike Corey. I'm a professor also in the Educational Technology Leadership Program and a faculty member in Human Technology Collaboration and uh, excited to be here and talk with you this evening. Great. Um, so as you can see, we're all from the Ed Technology Leadership Program. Um, so we've been around for about 30 years um, doing Ed Technology and focusing on how to develop leaders in the field. Um, we offer online asynchronous courses um, and we've been doing that since the mid nineties. So I remember when I first came to GW the same year that Natalie did, we wrote all our own HTML pages back then. So we've been doing this through a variety of different technologies and we're looking forward to seeing how these current technologies are then to shape what we're doing and what teachers in the classroom are doing at all levels. And tonight we wanted to focus on how it's really then to start to um, potentially impact on K-12 education in particular. Um, you probably have heard in the news, there's lots of talk about ChatGPT and these new AI technologies. Um, and at times it can feel like what Charles Dickens described in A Tale of Two Cities, that. These are simultaneously the best of times. There are wonderful things we can do with these technologies. And at the same time, it could be the worst of times. Um, as we all know, these technologies make it very easy for students to cheat. Um, it makes it very easy to create misinformation campaigns. Um, we're, we're only starting to scratch the surface of all the both good and the not so good things that are then to come from this new round of technologies. Um, that we're going to talk about more tonight and show you some examples of as well. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started and um, talk a little bit more about where we are. Um, so ChatGPT um, was launched as kind of the fourth generation of OpenAI's what they call GPT models, um, which are generative pro generative pre-trained transformer models, which is a mouthful and not really that important to know, but that's the technology behind them. Um, so these, this newest model was released in the end of November, um, the very last day of November, and very quickly it caught on. Within the first week, there were several hundred thousand users. They reached a million daily users by the end of the month of December. Um, and this was a big step forward, um, but this also then came with some unease around how is this going to impact on schools. Um, within our research lab in the human technology collaboration area, we had been working with the GPT models and their predecessors um, for about a year before this. So last summer, we were doing some research with it. And my general observation would be, it created text about like that you would expect of 
a middle school student. Um, I have a ninth grader this year and a sixth grader. So I have a pretty good approximation of what a middle school student could um, pull together. We are sitting with that. Um, and then when this new model was released and on December 1st, I started playing with it. Uh, and it is impressive to see how much progress they made in a short period of time. And it's writing like a college student, even a graduate student in some cases. Um, it's really taken off in terms of what its capabilities are based on how they're retraining the models. Um, so that's where we are today. It's out there. Um, ChatGPT is probably the most famous of the models, but there are others that are around. And these are what we call generative AI systems. So they can generate content. So ChatGPT, for instance, can write essays. It can write poems songs, it can write email messages for you, it can write computer code for um, technologists. There's also versions of it you can use where you can put a PDF document in and it will um, let you ask questions of it and it will bring in information from outside of the document to help explain what's in the document. They can generate images. The three images you see on your screen, for example, are all generated by um, AI technologies. Uh, it can create animations. Google is about to release their version of the animation tool. They've been releasing research about it and short clips. Um, it does pretty impressive things with animation uh, and it doesn't take that much to do in terms of putting in the prompts to get them created. And they actually create it on their server space. So it, you don't have to have a very powerful computer to do that. There's lots of talk around at generating music. Um, you can put in the types of music that you want and it will actually bring in audio files of different samples and put them together in unique ways to create new music. And of course, as we've heard for a while, we've been using AI type of technologies in medical imaging to di diagnose illnesses. They've been using it to fold proteins in biology. Um, and it can somewhat drive cars. Um, it's still a developing technology in that area. And now we're starting to see lots of ideas popping up. So who knows where exactly we will go next? Um, I think that there's both going to be some very exciting things that we'll see coming down the road soon. And there's some that are probably going to make us, um, again, a little concerned about where this is going and how we should work with it, react to it, um, how then we can help our students know how to use it wisely and appropriately. So for those of you who haven't seen it as of yet, um, I have just a couple of short examples to give you an idea of what ChatGPT is capable of. So this first example, um, I believe I'm still on the first example. There we go. And where is the play button? Hmm, maybe I won't have an example. <laughs> Let's see. Nope, it just keeps looping back through. Um, I gave this talk yesterday and it did not happen. So I'll have to think for a minute about this. Um, what I could do is I can come back to the examples as well, because I think it's really helpful to see um, ChatGPT in action. Um, yeah, maybe what I'll do actually is I can jump out of my presentation and see if it just runs on the screen. Oh, no, it just has the image link. Um, I can, one more second and I will get this working. Let's see if this other version of the presentation has it working. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing for one second. And now I will reshare and hopefully, okay, so go to this. 
Uh, now we have a play button. So in this first example, I asked ChatGPT to provide a 300 word summary of the three primary causes of the French Revolution as compared to the American Revolution. As you can see, within seconds, it gets started writing and it starts to outline what are some of those significant influences as the causations of these two revolutions. Um, so it says financial crisis, France was facing a severe financial crisis. Um, and it goes on um, up to the 300 word limit that I had given it for this example. Uh, so it can create this very quickly as you're seeing. And what it's doing is quickly determining what word should follow the previous word. So it actually does not know the meaning of the words that it is stringing together here. It just knows that they should come together based on the language model that it has developed by reading lots and lots and lots of text. So I'll go ahead and do another example. And in this example, um, I will prompt it with the write me a poem about butterflies. Um, and I asked it to do this in the style of a Winston Churchill speech. And so it starts out, hark, listen to my words, my friends, for I speak of creatures small yet grand with fluttering wings and colors bright. They dance in fields and gracefully in graceful band. Um, so it can write a pretty decent poem and you can do it in many different ways. Um, so it has, because it's a trained language model, it was trained on all the speeches of Winston Churchill and other writings. So it would be familiar with what word patterns um, his speeches would commonly have together. And then it can write a poem about butterflies based on prior poems that it has read as well. Again, though I emphasize, it doesn't know the meanings of any of the words that it's stringing together and we shouldn't confuse it with having that type of knowledge. So we'll go ahead and do one more example. Um, in this example, oh, maybe it is just those two examples that I have in this other talk. So that just gives you two quick examples of what ChatGPT is capable of. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and go back to my original presentation. Um, give me one second. There we go. And so if that's what chat GPT is capable of, what is it exactly that we're talking about when we say this is artificial intelligence? So one definition, and there are many definitions of artificial intelligence, is that it is the science and engineering of making computers behave in the ways that until recently, we thought required human intelligence. And I think if you look at the examples, even just the two that I showed, and there are many more, uh, ChatGPT is doing something that until very recently, we did not think a computer could do. We have been developing language models for some time. That's not really the new technology. But until recently, most computer scientists didn't even realize how powerful the models were in creating content that actually would make sense to people, that you could create a poem about butterflies on the fly that would actually be coherent. And a lot of it has to do with the other technologies that have developed around it at the same time. So within this definition, we would, we would say ChatGBT and these other, what we call generative AI tools are doing things that we thought would have required human intelligence. And so they're artificial intelligence. Now the key be idea behind AI is that we have machines that can mimic or reproduce some of the cognitive abilities of humans, such as perception, reasoning, decision-making, without necessarily in, like, in all of their other ways. Um, 
And this is actually how ChatGPT describes the idea behind AI. So it can give the illusion of perception, reasoning, and decision-making without necessarily having really human-like intelligence running behind it. So though we use the word intelligent, um, I, wouldn't mis I wouldn't confuse that with human intelligence. It doesn't work like the human brain works. Uh, we don't necessarily understand exactly how the human brain actually learns and does what it does. We have good ideas, but we don't understand all of it. Um, and what a machine is doing when it's learning is not the same type of learning. And we call this machine learning when we have a machine that is um, doing something that we might otherwise describe if a human or an animal was doing it as learning. Um, so as I've mentioned, these are what we call large language models. Um, and it is a type of machine learning that is trained. So people put data into it to train it and they're training it on a large amount of data and so that it can identify patterns and similarities in that data and then make predictions based on those patterns. And that would simulate how humans and animals might learn. And so we, that's why it falls within the field of machine learning. So large language models, as I've mentioned, um, are a type of what we call neural networks. Um, and you don't have to understand the details of how they work, but it's important to understand that what they're doing is essentially taking large amounts of books, text, articles, tweets, you name it, it's in there. They're looking at each word. So they take each word as a unique character and they call it a token. And they map them together to say when how are they related? So if one word appears, what is the likelihood that the word after it should be another word? And they can do that within phrases, within context, which is the really impressive advancements of chat GPT is that it will, as you ask it more questions, it will answer them differently, unique just to you. So if you ask it to do something, it's going to give a different response than if I ask it to do something because it's learning based on the responses that it's given me and what I've asked it. But essentially it's doing a lot of calculations very quickly, kind of similar to the image at the bottom. So if the sentence that it is writing is the best thing about AI is its ability to, then it looks at what are the probabilities of the word that should follow the two. Um, in this case, 4.5% of the time, the word learn should follow the word too. And I think what gets interesting, and this is where it gets even more complicated, is it doesn't always predict, I mean, it doesn't always choose the word that had the highest probability. Um, and that's where it adds in some of the variation that makes it even sound more natural then if it always picked the word of the highest probability, a lot of times the sentences would end up not making as much sense. And that's really where the programmers and the technicians behind ChatGPT um, fine tune the model to make it even more accessible and usable by the user is by how they determine when and how to pick different words to follow. So again, all of this feels very sudden. Um, it came out at the end of November, beginning of December, lots of news about it, um, but it hasn't really been that sudden. These technologies have been developing over the past five, seven years, um, some based on new types of technologies such as computer chips that allow this to happen better. Um, so for example, graphical processors were developed for gaming um, but they actually do a very good job when applied to machine learning, just based on their structures. Tensor chips are also been developed specifically to enhance machine learning. So machines can do this much more quickly. Um, we also have had uh, a lot more data becoming available and that has 
allowed us to do a lot more things with machine learning. Um, and of course, money helps. And with venture capital, there's more and more money. So I should point out though, that what we're looking at with large language models and the current AI and what we're reading about, this should not be confused with artificial general intelligence, um, which is kind of the concept that you might think of with Terminator where uh, we create artificial intelligence that has free will and sets its own goals and goes about achieving those. That is not the technology that we're actually looking at at this point in time. Um, I'm not an expert in AGI and when it will come, if it will come. Um, there are others who follow that much more closely, um, but we're a long ways off from that technology at this point. These are very much um, very specific applications. They only respond to prompts that we give it. It doesn't decide what to do on its own without human so, intervention. Ryan, we have a couple of questions in the chat. So um, I'll, add, I'll ask two that I think are pertinent and see, okay. if, see what you think, because I'm really curious myself. Um, one is what are the limitations of chat GPT? Um, well, ChatGPT specifically, it's a text-based language model. So it's not the one that draws pictures or creates animations. It doesn't create audio. Um, its primary purpose is to respond to text prompts. Um, now that doesn't say that you can't do a lot of interesting things with it though. Um, so there are ways that you can use ChatGPT to create graphics like flowcharts and stuff for you. Um, and people are experimenting with other ways to link ChatGPT to other websites so that you could, for example, scrape information off other websites using ChatGPT too. Um, but yeah, that's one of the limitations of that model. Um, generative yeah, not... AI in general, again, has its limitations. It's a set technology. It can't fold proteins. It can't drive cars. It's not connected with those other AIs that are also being developed um, in other fields. I also read an article um, preparing for this that the database or, or the information that it's using is all from 2021. Um, although it it's supposed to be updated or being updated. So that's a limitation. It's the data that's in it and the datedness, you know, how current that data is. One more question that I think pertains um, here. Does A, does what well, it, it was, the question was AI in general, but I think um, we could, we could ask, does chat GPT produce the same material or content content for each person? Like if you asked chat GPT, the same prompt, and if I ask the same prompt, would it provide the same information? Uh, it would provide similar information, but not exactly the same. Um, now, there are some limitations that, like if each of us signed up for new accounts and we had no previous personalized training in the system, then those are gonna be a lot more similar, but still not identical. But once you start using it, it is learning from that experience and those interactions, and it's gonna create new content unique to you um, based on your prior interactions with it. It's, um, in a way, it's building a model of you so that it can respond to you most effectively, uh, which is great some of the time. Um, and it's very useful that it gets better and better at responding to you and the types of things you prompted to do. Um, but then I think I know where the question is getting to is, well, how does that relate to trying to catch people who are using it if there's not really the same exact responses being given to everyone? And I think that's where it differs than the prior technologies and the tools we are using to catch plagiarism in the past where prior technologies for catching plagiarism looked for the same sentences. Uh, and then if it found duplicate sentences, it would mark it and highlight it. And um, this, those technologies are not useful for this. There are other technologies being developed that are trying to um, 
be able to identify when it is AI generated and not AI generated. OpenAI, the company that developed ChatGPT, um, started offering theirs. But even in their own announcement that they were offering it, it only had a 26% success rate of catching AI generated text as being AI generated. Um, and that's only if you have straight text out of the AI. If you paraphrase it at all, if you go in and make edits, then it's gonna be almost impossible for these tools at this point to pick it up. So I'll go on and if, Natalie, if there are other questions, I'm happy to answer them. I know you're gonna be presenting soon and you can answer a lot of them as well. Um, yeah, there are more, but those were, um, I think, the two that were real specific to chat, B, chat GPT and, you know, how it works. Okay, great. Um, so I like to think of the duality of AI um, and the Chinese character for crisis, I think, um, captures some of this duality for us. Um, I don't actually read Chinese. My kids take Chinese, but, um, but my understanding is the characters for crisis is a combination of two characters, one for the word danger and one for the word opportunity if they're separated. And I think both of those apply to what we're looking at with this new technology. So to start, I'll talk just a little bit briefly about some of the dangers or the concerns that we should have about these tools. Um, so, it does require lots of data and information. Um, as Natalie mentioned, it's trained on things up to 2021, but it's trained on a lot of stuff, billions of words. Um, everything from Wikipedia to Twitter to books that have been scanned to the internet, you name it, it's in there. Um, and not all of it was taken with explicit permission. And this has become a big issue in relation to the art programs more specifically. Um, they were trained with art images from the internet, but the artist didn't always give them permission to include those images. Um, so that will be battled out in the courts as to whether those um, explicitly violated copyright or not. And there are lawsuits pending. Um, also, um, so when you prompt ChatGPT and ask it a question, um, it gives you an answer. And this is very different than a Google search, where a Google search, you ask it a question, essentially, and it gives you choices. And you can go to the choices and apply your own critical thinking and decide which choice is the one that best answers your question or which combination. And I think this gives ChatGPT um, an authority voice by just answering the question. And I think people will often misconceive that to be the answer when it's really just one of the answers. And it may not even be the correct answer because again, ChatGPT has no knowledge of what the words mean that it's leaning, that it's putting together. It just knows they should go together. And there are some very good examples of where ChatGPT gets things very wrong. Um, early on, I remember one that was going around Twitter was someone asked ChatGPT about Hillary Clinton. And it said that Hillary Clinton was like the 50th president of the United States. Um, of course, we know she was not elected, but it was written about so many times that she would be president that ChatGPT thought that those words belong together, even though that wasn't actually factual. So, and it will make stuff up. So it's routinely wrong. It's very confident in its wrongness. It'll make up journals that don't exist, articles and journals that were never written, authors of articles that were never alive. Um, so you do have to be very careful with it. Now that said, people are working on tools that will lay on top of these models that will correct that. Um, so it'll go through and correct the information that is wrong. Um, so it'll get better with time in terms of its ability to be correct, or at least to offer one of the answers, maybe not the answer. 
So that, that also... is one question. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so that was one question. What can ensure the validity and reliability of the content? Currently, nothing within the models. Um, yeah, the models are just words in a giant, imagine three dimensional space, and it's figuring out which ones are closest to each other and how to put those together in an order. Um, so it doesn't know what the right answer would be, nor does it care. It's, that's not the task that it was built for. So you would have to do that on top of it. Um, now, some applications are very good about this. So I have one on my phone where you can chat with historical figures. So you can chat with Martha Washington and ask her about what it's like to be married to George Washington. And nicely at the beginning, it does say that you should check all of the facts that it doesn't necessarily actually know what Martha Washington thought about living with George Washington. Um, but based on the language model, you get to have a conversation and it will give you an answer to that question of what it would have been like based on the words that should go together. It's an interesting experience. Um, it's very engaging. And I'll talk about that on the next slide, actually. Um, so there are many challenges. Um, the systems have biases. Uh, some of those are biases that we like, and some of those are biases that we don't like. And as new companies and new people develop new models, there will be new biases that go into those. ChatGPT tends to lean on a political scale towards liberal or libertarian. Um, but there are new models being developed that will lean on the conservative side and how they respond. Um, so ChatGPT, when it was developed by OpenAI, they chose what data goes into it. Some of those we agree with. Some of those choices we probably agree with, such as taking out some hate speech, taking out things from pornography websites. Other choices, though, we may not quite agree with what they decided to put in or not put in. Um, so we'll see a lot of debate about that going forward. Transparency, we don't know really how exactly the model is developed and what's going on. The explainability is an issue of how can you explain why it gets one result and not another. Um, data privacy, data ownership, um, the anthropomorphism, <laughs> always a word that trips me up. Um, but that's a challenge of people thinking that it's more human than it really is. It's easy to talk about ChatGPT as like, oh, I was talking. I asked ChatGPT this, and it told me that. Um, like it's human, and it's not human. It is just a language model. Um, and I think we want to talk about it as an it and not a them. Um, there are environmental concerns. It takes a lot of energy to run these models, um, to make the models. It's hugely expensive and a lot of computing power. Concerns about inequality. We, in AI research, they talk a lot about AI alignment. And this is the idea is can we keep AI working towards human um, values and not working against humans? So this is that AGI will AI turn against us types of concerns. Um, there's also concern about the self-reference spiral where, as Nadia pointed out, this current model is trained on things up to 2021. New models will have newer data, but those newer data will also include things written by AI. And so, not everything will be human generated. Like this current model, everything it read was primarily just human generated input. But in a year when new models are created, it will be reading things that it itself wrote. And since it itself can write a whole lot of stuff, um, in the near future, it will be self-referencing to a lot of its own work, which could put us into a spiral where not, new knowledge is not coming in, but we're just reliving in old knowledge which gets into concerns of epistemologies. 
But that's balanced then with great opportunities. As I said, it can be very engaging, create interactive experiences for students, getting to talk with historical figures, running simulations. Um, it does all those things very well. Um, you can personalize information. So a lot of customer service chatbots are starting to use it. So they sound more natural. They can answer more questions. Um, accessibility, uh, I think this will be a big area. Uh, my in-laws are actually buying a new home near us and we were going over some legal documents and we couldn't figure out what part of it meant. And so I put it into chat GPT and I said, what does this section of this legal document mean? And it explained it in lay language. I could talk about it. Um, you could just imagine for people where English is a second language, the ability to actually get information to summarize legal documents, um, such as a lease or information on filling out forms for schools, um, that would be a very big use um, and give accessibility to a lot of information that wasn't accessible before. It's being integrated. Um, it's in the Bing search engine already. There's, it's going into Microsoft Word. They're a big financial supporter of OpenAI. Um, it'll be coming into your email programs, your phones, where it will write draft emails for you. Um, but as we saw earlier this week, Vanderbilt University had a little trouble with this in terms of someone used it to write an email when they probably shouldn't have had a computer generate the email. Um, the email is in relation to the shootings at Michigan State, which are very unfortunate. Um, there's also some interesting applications. Like I saw one they're working on to integrate it into Zoom so that it will summarize your meetings and do the to-do list of who agreed to do what at the end of a meeting. And then it can um, produce that for you so you don't have to have a note taker at the meetings. In education, it can hopefully make us uh, or give us the opportunity to work with students more on critical thinking and metacognition. If we can get past some of the um, writing challenges that a lot of students have, um, it's really nice, for example, to be able to have do brainstorming with it and then do your own critical thinking on top of that. And I'll talk more about that on the next slide. So some uses that I think are valuable. Um, so as I just said, brainstorming ideas, um, I've been using it for that quite a bit. Um, you can ask it to give you 20 ideas as to why things are related to each other. Um, you can have it evaluate new ideas. So if you don't have um, things to, if you don't have somebody, a human to run things past, you're working on something at 11 o'clock at night, you can ask ChatGPT about that. You can ask it to provide counter arguments to your arguments if you're writing a paper, for example. Um, and it can provide those. And again, that can give you the opportunity to do the critical thinking on top of it. Um, of course, where the danger happens is when we stop doing our thinking on top of the resources that it is providing. Um, and I think that's where we in education will have to work hard to figure out how we integrate this in and work with our students to appropriately use it and to wisely use it, not to replace their thinking, but to really augment their thinking and allow them to do different things with their thinking than they may have otherwise. Um, it can explain grammar, vocabulary, can tell you why sentence structure is better than the other. Um, <laughs> I've used it to write catchy titles. Um, I'm never good at titling presentations. Um, so I had it write, give me 20 titles. And then I kind of weaved a couple of them together to create the one I ended with. It can summarize text. Um, it can do the formatting of your references, which is really nice. It's kind of a mundane task. And if I can have an AI do that for me, I'm very happy. It can translate back and forth between languages. It can explain new concepts. Um, so I've been using it a lot for this when I'm reading articles, instead of skipping over the ideas that I was unsure of, now I can just ask ChatGPT to explain it to me, and then I can better understand what I'm reading. Um, and that 
makes me a better reader and it helps with the efficiency because uh, it's not that I have to go and click on 10 different websites like I would if I did a Google search for the concept. Um, it will give me an explanation. As I said before, it may not be the perfect or the right explanation precisely, um, but a lot of times I just want to get the main idea of the concept or to hear it in different words. Sometimes the way the author said it doesn't click, but if I have it said again in different words, then it will click. Um, as I mentioned, it writes code. If we have people who teach computer science in high schools or middle schools, um, it does a really good job of this. You can debug code with it. Um, and you can do different things with data. You can classify data. You can extract data from text in interesting ways. So there's lots of opportunities. Um, and I think so now I'll turn it over to Natalie to talk about some of her observations and experiences and where she sees it going in K-12 education. Yeah, so thank you, Ryan, um, for helping us understand better what chat, chat GPT is and what it means. And um, we do have a bunch of questions and we'll try to get to them as well. So one of my big questions when I think of something like chat GPT or artificial intelligence is just really what's that bigger idea? What's the bigger idea that we're really confronted with? And that is what is the role of technology in K-12 education? And it's something that um, certainly with emergency remote teaching and learning that happened early on in the pandemic and the shift from one day to another to using all kinds of technology and having to learn how to use all kinds of technology. Um, we didn't really have much time for reflection and deep thinking about what the role of technology is in K-12 because it was basically running it for a while. But since things have moved along um, in the pandemic and um, I think schools are now starting to make more informed choices I think returning to this question and really thinking about what is the role and, and also thinking about what is the role for AI in K-12 education. Next slide, please. So I think we all have to just understand no matter how nervous, anxious, angry, all those wonderful or negative feelings or mixed feelings you might have about AI, it is here to stay. And as Ryan mentioned earlier, it's been around for quite some time. It's just that ChatGPT is taking advantage of it, some advances in technology that are allowing us to use it in ways that hasn't been as broadly uh, available to the, you know, anyone, pretty much anyone in the world. Um, my best advice is that we need to have proactive and reactive education plans, policies, and research. And you know, I find that with a lot of technologies, no matter how much we work in education, we're we're thinking about it in a reactive way. So I often, when I when I think about technology, I think of well, what can we try to do proactively? I'm sure your schools have policies in place. Um, and relying on those established policies is really important, but it's also important to be flexible. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So again, um, thinking about being proactive and reactive, all, all of these points can be applied in a proactive way as well as a reactive way. And when I think of AI and chat GPT in K-12 schools, I also think of, well, it's, it shouldn't just be the teacher's responsibility to figure things out. Uh, you know, schools, it, I often say with education and, and raising children, it, it takes a village. So thinking about what are, what are the policies that exist? What policies need to be revised in light of tools like chat GPT? Um, there's also a need to, as I mentioned, not only reflect on, but really for school administrators to coordinate periodic reviews of technology and their implications. You know, how is this working in reality? What are the challenges that teachers and students and, and their families are encountering with these technologies? What changes in policy might be needed? Um, I personally am not an advocate of banning because, you know, you might ban something 
you might ban something um, in person, I mean, in, in school, but yet students have it on their phone and they can run it or they can use it at home. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't think banning necessarily is, is the answer, but, you know, your own community might decide to ban it and that's your choice. Um, I just think that banning is not going to stop its use. The other is that we really need to turn to our students. And, and one of the questions that was in the chat is, uh, how comfortable should I be with, with this tool? Or how comfortable, how comfortable should educators be with ChatGPT? And now, we can't all be experts in every single tool that gets developed today, tomorrow, yesterday. Um, you, you just can't be. So learning from our students, learning from all the different people, um, learning from experts like my colleague Ryan and my colleague Mike Corey, um, getting information is really important for school leaders to be leading that and learning from. Um, also, corrupt professional development you know, is really, really important, as well as parent education. Uh, sometimes Professional development only focuses on teachers and schools, but parents really need to be learning about these tools as well and how they can help their own children or adolescents and young adults understand the ramifications of using these tools. And some of the facts that Ryan shared about the limitations of the tools and how it can provide incorrect information. So how can students be more critical about using these tools? Um, the other is, and as a researcher, uh, although I'm not doing any chat GPT research, um, partnering with researchers because that's how we learn about, um, that's how we can learn more about these different tools. Next slide, please. So this particular webinar was really intended more so for K-12 teachers. So. Ryan outlined some of the different ways that teachers can use ChatGPT with their students. The one thing that I'll emphasize is that we have to consider, and I know teachers do this all the time, what is developmentally appropriate for the different students that are using these tools? Um, you know, and, and do they, you know, how, how deeply or how well might they understand the limitations of the tools? Um, I also encourage teachers to experiment with these tools so that you can gain some comfort. And, and it's possible you may not ever be comfortable with using them because it might be a little too, you know, um, too out there to think like, wow, this is, you know, we're able to use these tools in these ways. And it's, it is, it is, and it can be scary. The other is one thing that I have been encouraging folks to do a great deal more lately because so often we focus on the bells and whistles of technology, but we don't often think about, well, what are the negative aspects or how might it harm students or harm their understanding and learning? So teaching students how to be critical consumers and understand the limitations and how it can actually harm is really important also. I already mentioned learning from and with students that I think K-12 administrators should do, but most definitely teachers as well. And I think getting students involved in determining what are uses, effective uses, brainstorming ideas about how they might actually use chat GPT in classrooms. Again, thinking about this in a developmental, develop, developmentally appropriate way. You're probably not gonna ask kindergartners how you might use chat GPT, but I would say, you know, elementary students a little bit older on up, you can engage them in that process in different ways and, and determine that with them. Develop and share lesson plans is another idea. Um, people are already developing and sharing lesson plans in the references at the end. Um, there's a group, Civics for Technology, that have a number of, le of lessons that you can actually apply. Um, there's another organization that that's noted in the references too that have tons of um, concrete tools that you can use to help teach AI in the classroom. And then I think the last three speak for themselves, seeking professional development, um, again, participating in research. And the last one, 
I think is really important and one that teachers often do in their own classrooms, sharing what you're learning, but sharing it also at conferences, um, you know, maybe partnering with a, a researcher and sharing your your what you've learned through an interview or informal or formal. Um, so all kinds of ways that you can um, share what you're learning, but also sharing what students have been teaching you as well. Next slide. I think we're going to turn to Mike now. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie, and thanks, Ryan. This has been wonderful, and I uh, hope everyone's learning a lot and uh, the creative juices are flowing. So a couple of things uh, before I jump into my slides that I wanted to follow up on. Uh, one, I don't think we told anybody how to, to, to get in and play with chat uh, GPT. It's free for the time being. And uh, Ryan, I don't know if you can put in the, in the chat box how to get in, but it's chat.openai.com. And uh, uh, it's been, it was super easy to sign up and it's really very intuitive uh, to use. And uh, I don't want everybody to leave and go and sign up right at this moment. So, so hold on that. But I would, uh, if you haven't done so already, I'd encourage you to get in and try it out. And uh, I think you'll be amazed at the things it can, it can do for you. Um, and I should also mention that uh, Ryan uh, discussed that this, uh, one of the big backers of OpenAI is Microsoft, and that's the, the chat GPT is going to be infused in the Bing search engine before too long, and, uh, and they're already in the process. Google, not to be outdone, is doing their own thing. It's called BARD, B-A-R-D, and uh, BARD uh, had a little, uh, they had a little preview of it uh, a couple weeks ago. It had a little bit of a hiccup. So I don't know if that'll delay it when it's released or not, but BARD will be coming along and that'll be tied to the Google search. Um, it's, I guess I'm telling you this because uh, chat, AI, language learning models are gonna be everywhere. And uh, I think the time for us to really think in K-12 education about uses, uh, effective uses for our students is, is right now. And just like these language models are gonna be learning the more that people use them, we're gonna be learning new ways to use them, new ways to apply, to apply them so that students can find success. And I think this is gonna have a tremendous impact on the way we teach, the way we learn um, and education in general. So it's an exciting time, it's a fun time. Uh, and I'd invite you to get out and, and try it out. And I think you'll really, uh, you'll, it'll open your eyes and, and really get you excited about this. So with that in mind, um, I wanna talk a little bit, I, I do a lot of, uh, well, all three of us do a lot of online learning and teaching online. I, I work a lot with K-12 uh, uh, learners and teachers. And so I wanted to take just a few minutes and talk about uh, these advantages and disadvantages of, of these AI language models in, uh, in online learning. And so some of them will be very, there'll be some overlap between what uh, I'm saying, what Ryan and Natalie have said, but some of the things will be new. For example, I want you to think for a moment about 24 seven availability uh, with a chat GPT model or something like that in AI. Uh, our online learners or any of our learners, if they're looking for uh, responses to questions, uh, they no longer need to wait for the availability of a teacher. Uh, they can now, they can go out in real time, 24 seven get answers from these AI language models. And that feedback is instantaneous. Uh, there's no need to wait for a reply or a post from a, from a human being. They can get a response quickly. Now, Ryan, if you go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, as Ryan has mentioned, these models, these AI models will become very personalized with time. And uh, they become personalized to the individual learner. And this can result in increased attention and focus on specific learner needs and preferences. And I think this is gonna be one of the biggest impacts on learning that we see. And uh, because uh, you know, the, the individual learner has their own needs uh, and uh, a teacher in a classroom, uh, whether it's face-to-face -face or online is not gonna be able to spend uh, time with each student, the amount of time they may need. But uh, these AI models and particularly these language models are gonna uh, make that more possible. They're also very cost effective. So if you're an administrator involved with budgets and money and uh, 
revenue and uh, expenses, uh, AI language models can be much less expensive than hiring human teachers. Now, I'll throw the caveat out there. My wife is a, is a teacher, so I have to throw this caveat out there. I don't think this is going to replace teachers, but it can be a cost-effective 24-7 supplement or tutor to uh, teachers, particularly in our online environment. Uh, Ryan, the next slide, please. And uh, the other thing to think about with uh, these models is the scalability. Uh, now, a, a, with the use of chat uh, GPT or AI language models or other AI, you can now serve many, many more students. And uh, the, the impact of performance from the AI language model is not gonna be affected. Now, I will tell you when I went to sign up for chat GPT, uh, I did have to wait because there was too many users on at the time, but I know that, uh, and computing uh, can be an issue uh, uh, because more and more computing power is needed to support these uh, types of models. But with the time, uh, the scalability has become a, a major impact and a major player in education in online and in face-to-face. -face. Brian, if you could go to the next slide, please. So now I want to talk for a few minutes about some of the limitations or pitfalls. Uh, and the first one, uh, as Ryan and Natalie have alluded, uh, the data that these uh, chat GPT or any of these AI language models use is only as what they use and what they're pointed at is as good as the answer as you're going to get. In other words, uh, you know, what, what goes in is what comes out in some respects. And uh, so you have to be careful with that. And there are some limitations in understanding. Uh, AI, AI language models may not understand content or complex questions if you're asked them. Now, just to give you an idea, and I didn't ask a complex question, but I thought it was interesting. Uh, one of the questions I, and most of the questions I've asked ChatGPT, they've come up with very nice, uh, succinct, good answers. Uh, but I asked a very simple question. I said, who won the Super Bowl in 2020, 2023? Now, of course, we know that ChatGPT, Natalie has told us, only has data up through 2021. So I thought, well, I'm gonna try this out and see how it works. So it told me it was sorry, but it didn't have the ability to predict future events. And of course, this role was played earlier this month. So it wasn't a future event, but, and it says, uh, but I can tell you in 2022, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers won the Super Bowl. So for those of you who are football fans, you know, that's not accurate. In 2022, the Los Angeles Rams won the Super Bowl. So I said, okay, I know that's not the right answer. Let me ask chat GPT as a follow-up. So I said, who won the Super Bowl in January, 2022? And it said, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers won the Super Bowl in January, 2022. But then it went on in the same uh, response to say, they defeated the Kansas City Chiefs with a score of 31 to nine, which was held on February 7th, 2021. I said, well, wait a minute. You just told me a sentence before it was in 2022. And now you're saying 2021. Um, then I said, okay, well, who won the, the Super Bowl in February 2022, which I know is when it was played. It wasn't played in January. And it went on to say, and I finally uh, uh, started to, to get to the right answer. And it said, um, well, I can't tell you that because I don't know that's a future event. And I said, okay, let me back up and say who won it in February 2021. And then they got the right answer. They said uh, who had won it and it was accurate and Tampa Bay had won it. Uh, so. I, I'm using that example just to tell you that you need to be careful. And if I had to, uh, any advice to give to you, to your students, to anyone using ChatGPT, uh, it is to verify what information you're getting and verify it once, twice, three times, because uh, uh, you're going to get some information that's just not right. It's just not, uh, the uh, ChatGPT doesn't quite understand the complexity of the question and what's going on. Now, with that said, I still think it has wonderful potential and it produces some amazing uh, outcomes. Ryan, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, a couple other quick things. I think I have three more bullet points on some of the disadvantages of chat GPT, particularly in online learning, is one, uh, it lacks emotional intelligence. It's, it's, a, it's a computers, it's a bunch of computers put together and the results uh, may not take into consideration, in fact, it will not take into consideration emotions very well. And the second one is uh, lack of creativity and critical thinking. Now, while it can help you with your critical thinking, it is going to put together a string of complex sounding responses 
and they may lack that creative spark or critical analysis. Uh, so I think it's a great supplement. Uh, if I was having a hard time writing something, I might go out to chat GPT and say, hey, you know, tell me a little bit about this or something like that, just to get the creative juices flowing and it will give me two or three things to start me thinking uh, and analyzing in a more critical fashion. Next statement, or next slide, please. Oh, I have a couple more. Uh, as Ryan has mentioned, biases can be built into the data and the responses, which I think is really important to consider. And then privacy and security, we haven't talked much about. Um, you know, at the university, we have an institutional review board or IRB, which uh, kind of keeps uh, guard of many things. And we have security and privacy uh, uh, policies. Uh, Chat GPT and AI language models don't have those built in. So you need to be careful with privacy and security. And uh, I can't remember if it was Ryan or Natalie talked about intellectual property rights and uh, that falls into this uh, general category also. And that's a huge, huge issue. And I think there's one more slide if I don't. Nope, I'll turn it back now to Ryan. I think, I think that so. comes back to me, yeah. So advice. Um, First and foremost, I would say, talk with people about it. Um, talk with your colleagues at work. Um, talk about what your concerns are about how this will be used in the classroom. And um, talk with your students then about those issues. Um, as Natalie said in the chat, it's important that students understand uh, what cheating is and that using something that's generated by chat gpt as your assignment is a form of cheating uh, potentially using it as a brainstorming companion would not be it depends on the teacher and the rules the teacher puts down um, but having open discussions with this will help our students know how to use it uh, like william said in the chat i want to believe that most of our students Almost all of them are going to use this in good ways. And I don't, we don't want to start from the perspective of, well, everyone is going to be cheating with this because we know that we have very good students um, and most of them want to learn new skills and learn new knowledge and want to grow in new ways. Um, but there will be some that don't know exactly what cheating is potentially or not understand that this is a form of cheating. Um, and we want to have that conversation with them. That also then helps them be aware that you're aware. Um, so you don't want to be the teacher that the students think they're pulling a fast one over on. So have those conversations with them about chat GPT, what it's good for, how you'll know kind of when they're using it, when they're not using it. You may exaggerate a little bit about how good you are at detecting it. Um, up to this point, I think a lot of the detection, the software or this um, platforms like GPT-0 can be helpful. Um, they're not great, but they can be helpful um, for determining if it thinks that an AI wrote it. Um, one of the more powerful ways is to know your students and know what they're capable of. I had a colleague write the other day that she caught her first student using chat GPT to submit a response. Um, and it turned out how she knew it, the student had done it was she said the student, um, she knew the student could never write that well. And what chat GPT produced was quite elegant and the grammar was all perfect and it used vocabulary the student wouldn't have used. Um, and so that's how she got suspicious. And then she used the checker and it was confident that it was written by ChatGPT. Um, so please don't let the conversation stop here. This hopefully is an initial part to give you a little bit more grounding and foundation in what ChatGPT and these other generative AI models can do and are capable of, so that you can have conversations again with your colleagues and students about um, how this is impacting, how you might change your assessment strategies, how you might rethink some of your lessons, um, and how you may engage your students and encourage your students to use it so that they're starting to build those skills for the future. Um, so if you would like to be on a mailing list for some resources and upcoming events, 
future webinars that we might offer, future summer workshops we may have around K-12 and AI, um, or ones that we see others are offering. You can go to the website listed and there's a short Google form. Um, we promise not to spam you or to sell your data to others. Um, but when we see things, we can email it out to this group um, and to others to share what's going on in the community, what types of resources are being developed to help support all of us as we try to figure out um, how K-12 and higher education is being changed by these new technologies. Um, so Natalie put that link directly into the chat room so you can just click on it there. And there are also resources available to you. Um, as Mike said, there's the link to get into ChatGPT. Um, that's also the link right below that to their classifier that tries to determine if the content was written by it. Um, the other one that's very popular is called GPT-0, Z-E-R-O. Z -E -R -O. Um, and we can add a link to that um, as well. So updating your course, I, I wrote an article back in December offering ideas of activities that you can do with students um, to use ChatGPT. Um, you can access that there. There's also some advice from others in academia. Um, just a variety of resources um, that you can use as you try to get more knowledgeable and stay up with the technologies that are shaping education today. And now we have a little time for Q&A. Um, if people have questions, we're happy to give our responses. You can either put it directly into um, the discussion board, or if you want to, you can raise your hand and then we can um, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. So there, there was one question that someone asked um, earlier. Uh, it's how can educators use chat GPT and ensure students don't overuse it? And you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is teaching students self-regulation. Um, and that, you know, I, 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 the first analogy that comes to me is like with gaming. Um, you know, some students or some children as, as one of my children <laughs> in the past, um, you know, we, we had so many discussions about gaming and how many hours. And, and I know some parents that I knew, they would just say, you know, they wouldn't allow their, their children to game after a certain hour or only a certain number of hours per day. And, you know, when my, when my son was 16, 17, I thought if I'm not teaching him some self-regulation skills, he's going to go to, when he leaves home and, and he hasn't gone to college, he may be gaming all day if I don't teach him some self-regulation. So again, you know, I think we, we had as educators, you know, helping our students understand what are the pros, what are the cons, helping students understand when it might be harming themselves, when it could be encouraging harm of others, um, when you're over, you know, what is overuse, um, if, it, if it even became an issue. Now, some students might be more inclined to going in that direction because of just their kind of, you know, the way they are. Um, but that's what I would suggest, really thinking about be, helping students being critical of the technology, understanding its limitations and so on, um, and then learning how to self-regulate themselves. And one thing that um, you mentioned briefly earlier, Natalie, that I agree with too, is how we can get the parents up to speed on some of this, because a lot of it's gonna fall on parents to help manage when they're using this at home, um, how they're using it with their homework, and now there are some really good ways to use it. Um, so as I mentioned, I've been using it with my children and um, I have it open and we talk about what we're seeing on the responses and we talk about how it may be helpful. Um, but then we also shut it off then and talk about it further and use our own critical thinking. Um, but it can be very helpful, I think, to a lot of parents who maybe are unfamiliar with some of the topics their children are studying. 
Um, so my older son is studying biology as a freshman in high school. I don't remember a lot of my biology and what I took in biology is probably very outdated. Um, so when I'm trying to help him study for tests or understand concepts, I found it to be helpful to refresh my own information or bring me up to date. Um, then there's a variety of tools like this. There's one that parents should be aware of, and I guess teachers should be aware of too, called PhotoMath, where students um, or anyone can take a picture of a math problem and it will show how to work through and how to get to the answer. Now it does give the answer. So the potential for skipping over the how does it work part is there, but it does try to force the student to go through, well, how did you work through to get that answer? Um, but for parents who maybe haven't taken math in a long time, or maybe never did well in math in the first place, a tool like that could be really helpful for helping them help their student. Um, so making sure they're aware of it and they're having conversations with their students. If they see their child using the tool a lot, then they should have a conversation about, are they actually doing their math? Or have they built up a reliance on a tool that's supposed to be there to help? It's not supposed to do it for them. Uh, can I just jump in too? I, I'll just re-emphasize this importance for parents to have these conversations with their children, but also for teachers to have conversations with their administrators, their policymakers, and figure out exactly what the rules, what the policies are, and then have those conversations with the students. Um, this is pretty new. I mean, in reality, uh, even though it's been around for, for a while in different versions, uh, the mainstream society has just jumped on since November, December, January, and many more are still jumping on board. And so this is new and it's, uh, you know, it, it, you need to talk about it in your, with your kids and with uh, your students. And uh, it's important to do so, so that everyone has a sense of stability uh, with everything that's going on. Are there any other questions? Again, you can put it in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, uh, we're happy to answer another few questions this evening. Well, um, Ryan, there was one question about how other divisions are embracing or taking a firm stance at blocking or curbing um, the use of chat GPT. Um, if you're embracing, how are you encouraging or training teachers to use it? So um, I'm thinking of the, we, we did a chat GPT session um, at GW that Ryan was, was a part of with a number of other professors. I don't know if you wanna share any big lessons learned from that session. Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to um, the instructional strategies that the instructor is using and what they're trying to accomplish for their students and with their students. Um, so for me, for example, since I teach in an ed technology program and our students are looking to be leaders in the field of ed technology, um, not letting them use it um, and not letting them get familiar with how it works, what works well, um, what are the limitations of it would do a disservice for them. Um, and I think that in a lot of fields, we will see these applications going forward. Um, so if you're preparing students for the workplace of the future, they're going to have to be able to work well with these technologies, and that's going to give them um, the skills that are going to be employable going forward. So if you're in those situations, then I think integrating it into your lessons, um, asking students to do the first round by looking at what ChatGPT says. And then, for example, what I did recently was I had students start with the responses of ChatGPT, and then I asked them to put it into a Google Doc and use comments and track changes to add to it, to correct it, um, to provide additional resources related to it. So they started with ChatGPT, but they weren't allowed to end with ChatGPT. Um, and I think that added 
both to their knowledge of what are the limitations of the tool, but also to the content knowledge of this subject that we were talking about at the time. So I think there's lots of creative ways that we'll be able to use these technologies. Um, it's gonna take time. Um, it's now you said, I'm also not in favor of banning. I think that if it is in a position where the technology is new, like it was in December, um, I can understand wanting to ban it um, and even having a temporary ban so that teachers and students can be trained on how to use it and how to use it wisely. But it would be temporary because again, we want to prepare our students for the future. And as you can imagine in the workplace, going forward, these tools are going to be available. It can make them more efficient and more effective. And so learning how to work well with it is a very important skill in terms of AI literacy uh, and our students and their preparedness for the future. Oh, and thank you, Jennifer, for posting um, that, yes, Fairfax County and Loudoun County, um, I believe both have banned it. I believe that um, Prince George's County and DC are still investigating and trying to determine what their policy should be. Um, banning it, though, on school computers, I think, um, may have been a good strategy a decade ago, but it's really hard to keep a technology like this out. Um, you can integrate it easily into even your Google search. So if you use, for example, the Chrome browser, you can add an extension where it adds ChatGPT to your Google search results. Um, and it would not go through the blocked IP addresses. It would go through a different IP. Um, we'll see more and more of that. At this point, um, the primary interface is through OpenAI's interface, but they have what we call APIs, which allow computer-to-computer -computer interaction with it and their prior models. And so you'll see it integrated more seamlessly without having to go to the OpenAI website, uh, making it harder and harder to block. And so it's a short-term answer potentially for some school districts. And I'll you know, reiterate this, uh, that these AI language models are gonna be tied into Bing shortly and Google search probably in the near future. So uh, banning is gonna be very, very difficult. And Elizabeth makes a good point that banning also creates equity issues. So some students who will have access at home on other devices um, or have their phone with them will be able to access it. While those students who rely on school issued machines may not have access then to the same tools that their peers have access to and that can create equity concerns. There was a good discussion of that actually yesterday, um, yesterday morning on NPR. Um, the show 1A, it's worth taking a listen to. It's a 30 minute segment on um, AI and education as well. Okay, if we don't have more questions then we can wrap it up for this evening. Um, again, I'll put up the the link if you want to get more information on upcoming events related to K-12 and AI. So future webinars that we're offering or colleagues are offering, um, summer workshops, for example, other types of events, um, you can go ahead and sign up there and we'll send those out to you when we see them come across our emails. Thank you all very much for spending the time with us this evening.